This morning, I wanted to talk a bit about listening to the Holy Spirit. Listening to the Holy Spirit. How do you hear from God? How does He direct your decisions and your journey of faith? Is He clear? Is God easy to understand? I think no. And yes, we have those times where God can be really clear. And other times it's that, where are you, Lord? Where are you, Lord? We can hear God today through so many different ways. We have, of course, that most of us is that, that inner voice, that knowing inside that the Holy Spirit is talking. If we're fortunate, like my father-in-law, we can have and hear at times an audible voice of God. Wouldn't that be something? What does God's voice sound like audibly? To have that audible voice saying something to us. Wow. We have, of course, the Bible. We have the Word of God that tells us. We can hear God in sermons. We can hear God through the fivefold ministry, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, apostles. We can hear God through so many different areas. We can hear God, and this is probably one of the big ones, you men. We can hear God through our wives. <laughs> Hold your breath. We can hear God through our wives. And sometimes, yeah, sometimes God will use our spouse, our wives or our husbands to actually reveal and say something. You're waiting for some clarity. We can even hear God through our children. And I love hearing the stories that people share about how God has revealed things to them through their children and shared things through their children. Our family, our situations can speak to us. Dreams and visions, having dreams. Has anyone had dreams of the Lord? Yes? Yeah, I've had a few dreams of the Lord. I'm asking God for more visions because young men have visions and I still feel young. But no, I have had dreams and visions from God and, and God's creation, of course, can speak to us and we can be led by so many different things. There are so many ways and yet at times it can be so quiet of how are we led by the Holy Spirit? Perhaps our version of listening to the Holy Spirit, now I want you to be honest, is... Father, we're just praying. Do we really, do we need to buy this car now? And we just go, flick it open, point to a verse. The sea saw it and fled. Jordan turned back. The Lord's saying we've got to turn back. We're not buying the car. Who's ever done that? Who's flicked the Bible open and, and gone? I can't be the only one who was an immature Christian. Who's ever done that, gone through? And I tell you, I actually have God spoken to me like that, where I've just flicked the Bible open and said, right, oh, Lord, what is it? And he puts a scripture in my heart, and, and I've opened things. But, of course, that was in my younger days. Um, there's so many different ways. I think when we look at things today, we can probably go that, well, wouldn't it be nice to hear God and see God move like he did in the Old Testament. But let me tell you that sometimes that wasn't as clear as what we think. They had their prophets um, that they would hear from the man of God or the, or the woman of God that was speaking. And they had a, something also that they used to use. And the Bible doesn't exactly go into it a lot, but there's thing called the Urim and the Thummim. Heard of that? The two stones, and when I was looking this up, there's different versions of it. Some say, from what I can gather, most of them say it's these two coloured stones. And, and the priest would wear the ephod and he had the 12 stones of the tribe. And then behind that was a pocket because it was close to his heart. And he would place the Urim and the Thummim in there. And then when they would do, it was called the perfection and the lights. And then what he would do was then you would come in and say... Um, you know, I just want to come before you, Lord, and say, do I buy my new Harley Davidson? And then they would go through and they take the stones out. And some say that the stones would light up with a word. Most of them say that it was which stone they chose, which was a yes or a no. I'm waiting for that stone to come out, Was Maybe, maybe. Imagine doing that. And it was basically, so the Bible says, what was that? <laughs> Is my wife ganging up on me? There's no stone there, yes. And um, they would see that. They would see a medium. Remember the story of um, Saul when he sought the medium to bring um, Samuel up from the ground. And they would have others, in some cases, would get a Levite, a priestly man, and he would stay in their homes and look at all these different things. I think that 
there are so many different ways that we hear the Lord today. And the hard part is with hearing the Lord and being led by the Spirit is it takes faith. It takes faith. You're listening to a God that you can't tangibly see, believing that what you're hearing is from a God that you believe in and going from the world. It's foolishness. Foolishness. Really? You're listening to who? A God that I can't see is telling you to do what? Foolishness. You should try telling non-Christians about that, especially when you're about giving. And they go, you are crazy. You are crazy. But there's faith involved. Faith comes into action there. Remember uh, I told a story a while ago about uh, a person who the Lord said to them to go and do a handstand at the drink machine. Do you remember that story? And so there's, I want to just look at that two sides of it where in that instance, God said to do something really crazy and this person did it, which caused an unsaved person to shriek and go, you don't know that I was about to take my life. And I said, God, if you're real, if you love me, I want someone to do a handstand right at that Coke machine and someone did it. There's the other side of that coin too. And I've been on this other side of the coin before. I think anyone who's been in leadership and pastoring would have been on this side of the coin. And I've told this story as well, but I might as well share it again. And that's the story of this person who went to the pastor and said that they felt they had to go overseas. And they were talking to the pastor about going overseas. And as during their discussion, and at the end, the person said to the pastor, well, pastor, thank you very much. I know that I have to go overseas now. I have to go overseas. And the pastor says, how do you figure that? Well, you didn't use the word squirrel. He said, what do you mean squirrel? He said, well, I prayed. This person said, I prayed to the Lord before I came to talk to you. And I said, Lord, if you don't want me to go, I want the pastor to use the word squirrel in a conversation. And so this person took that as God saying, I want to go. I have to go. It sounds crazy. But how often is our heart led by the things that we want to do? How we think. I remember when our first child was going to, uh, Seal was pregnant with our first child, I was so sure that Sarah was not Sarah, but Sarah was a boy. Oh, yeah. I was so sure. My wife knew better. But I was so sure. I said, no, I knew. Almost to the point of God said, I'm glad I didn't say it. Because I thought, God said, I'm going to have a son. God said, and I was so sure, so sure in my heart that I was going to have a son as my firstborn child. No, I got an amazing daughter instead. And just as well, I didn't say the Lord said. But see, it's so easy so often that we can be led by the desires of our heart. There are some certainties in our life that we can have when we're being led by the Holy Spirit. There's some certainties that we know in God. And one is God will never go against or contradict his word. He will never go against his word. He will never go against something that, that is clearly wrong in the Bible. And, and I hear, unfortunately, in leadership time again, that there are leaders who fall into sin and they say, yes, but God has given me a grace. God has given me a grace to leave my wife and children and be with someone else. God has given me a grace to go into this area, go into that area. And, and, and it happens because we think that God is okay, but God never goes against his word. Never goes against his word. He also never goes against his character. He never goes against the nature of who God is. It's impossible for God to do that. Neither will God go against his purpose and his plan. Oh, that we could know the purpose and plan of God. That we could know God's divine plan. I, I'll let you in a secret. A lot of times God will not tell you the big picture. You know why? Have a guess. We stuff it up. We put ourselves into the picture. We make it revolve around our thinking, our ideology, what we desire. But God has a plan. Remember, as we said, we heard before, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. 
that God's purpose and aim for humanity is that humanity would be restored back to the relationship with the Father. Yet so often today, we see such a dysfunctional Christianity because the Christianity of believers, a bride, has not learned how to live in this relationship with the Father, but only learned to live with gifts that we can throw around like dice and say, here's what I've got. That's not what God's after. He's after a personal relationship. He's after your time. He's after your language. He's after your conversations. He's after your thoughts, after your actions. He's after all, and the word says that he is a jealous God that desires all of you. God will not settle for part of you. For the Bible says that anyone who is lukewarm, he will spew out of his mouth. Because God isn't interested in part of you, but, but there is good news. The grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the Father will look and the Spirit is searching continually and continually and continually that now could be the time and now could be the time and now could be the time where you have that encounter with God that will draw you back into His presence. Draw you back into His presence. There are always three voices that you hear. One, of course, is your own voice. Your own voice isn't always bad. God gave us intelligence. God gave us wisdom. He gave us understanding. And your own voice can tell you, don't do something. I remember when I was growing up, Marie, I did have a propensity to get in trouble. And a lot of times as I was doing things that a young boy shouldn't do, um, when I'm saying, you know, bad news, don't never point an air rifle at a window of a car of your dad's EH because <laughs> the trigger will pull and you'll break the window and you'll get in trouble. Never play slip and slide on a soapy lino floor and you know what's going to happen. There will end up a hole in the wall. And your voice is telling you, do not do this. Do not do this. Do not do this. But no, <laughs> slip and slide, bang, through the wall. And it's not like it was today where you can just get a bit of jip rock. It was, uh, yes, I've had a few of those times. And your voice can also tell you, now's the time to jump. Now's the time to get out of the boat. Come on, you've seen it happen for other people. You can do this. Now is the time. Now is the time. And stepping forth, so you, God gives us that understanding, that reason, and that voice that we learn to nurture in God can change. I, I want to look at Saul and the life of Saul, if we can turn in our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 13. I wanted to look at the lives of Saul and David and how they were being led by God. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, Saul had become, in 1 Samuel we read how Saul had become king. It's quite interesting when you read in the scriptures that God actually says, here is your prince. And it was uh, Samuel that said, here is your king. But he places him there. And God gives him favour. Saul fights for the Jabesh Gilead and he defends him and says the Spirit of God. Now just a moment before that story where we read about Saul defeating the enemy, um, as they're going out and casting lots and they're looking for Saul, and remember what the Bible says, they said, where's Saul? Where's this man who was about to be appointed king? And he was hiding in the baggage. He was hiding. The man who was going to lead the nation of Israel was hiding. I think that gives you a bit of an indication of what kind of bloke you're going to get as your leader. And so they place him in there and Saul comes into that place as king. In 1 Samuel, let's jump, sorry, to 1 Samuel 15. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, that Saul was given a job to do. Um, Samuel said to Saul that he was to go out and defeat the Amalekites. Remember, the Amalekites were the first nation to come against Israel if they were leaving Egypt. They were picking off the stragglers and they were attacking Israel. And God said he was going to completely wipe Amal the Amalekites out. That took almost 900 years to come to pass. And that happened at um, Esther. And so in this place, 
when verse 10 of chapter 15, the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and not performed my commandments. We read in this chapter that Saul did not listen to what God says. Have you ever heard God speak to you and say something to you and you didn't do it? I think we've all had, you know, there's one instance that is really vivid in my mind. It was the day I got saved. As a 12-year-old boy, listening and Harry Bosky preached, and I'm sitting at the back in this tent, and I'm going, I need to get saved. And I ran home, because I wasn't going out the front with the P. I was on my own at church. I got kicked out of the house. Go to church. And it was the best thing my mum did, because I sat there and heard a gospel message. I got saved. I ran home, knelt at my bed, and I gave my life to the Lord. 12 years of age. And it was revival meetings, tent meetings were happening. And right there, I was looking forward to going back to church the next day. And some friends of my family said, hey, why don't you come and stay over? Their, their kids were the same age as me and my sister. And I said, and I, my first instance, the first voice I heard inside me was, you shouldn't go. Guess which voice I listened to. As a 12-year-old, I went. But it stuck with me. And it stuck with me because I learned something that day. I learned and I learned to hear that voice of the Holy Spirit saying, you shouldn't go. Now, I have no doubt whatsoever that was God showing me and teaching me something, not losing something. But I knew I had to listen to that voice and I had to listen to what the Holy Spirit was saying. And the, and the Lord had said to Samuel to wipe them out. But Samuel says in verse 13, then Samuel went to Saul and Saul said to him, blessed are you, the Lord. And this is Saul's response to Samuel. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. But Samuel said, what then is this bleating of sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And then Saul then continues to give them an excuse. See, when God says something, and he says how to do things. And he says, no, change your life. No, start searching me out. No, search me and desire me. He says, no, put those things aside. We can't just put part of the things aside. And I think it's that sin of omission where we go, I'll just do part. I'll reinterpret to how I think God, what God is really saying. And Saul fell into that trap. And when we look into later on in that chapter, there was the second thing that happened that Saul, after that first time when he was disobedient, then Samuel actually said to him, do you know, to obey is better. To obey is better. Andrew and I were talking before the service about a parable and we were talking about discipleship. And I said, you know, the, the thing is with discipleship, it's a two-edged, it's double because it's not only the person, the person who is being discipled and the need for discipleship is also that person going, I'll be discipled. I'll submit myself. I'll submit myself under an authority and I'll be discipled. I'll allow someone to speak into my life and shape this life. Sometimes I think we just wait for only the Lord is going to speak to me. But I tell you, I've heard a lot of things that my wife has said that has changed me as well. Because he uses people around us. Iron sharpens iron. In the second part of that chapter, we see where they're about to have a battle against the Philistines again. And except this time, Samuel said to Saul that he was to do wait for him for seven days. And Saul didn't do that. He didn't want to wait. And he got to seven days and he said, seven days is up. God's not here, right? Oh, I'm going to move. I'm going to do this myself. And he made the sacrifice and it cost him the kingdom. As he tore the cloak from Samuel, that the Lord said to him, now your kingdom shall be torn away from you. There's another voice that we hear too. And the other voice that we hear, it could be the devil. And when the enemy speaks, when the devil speaks, how is he going to speak to us? What does that voice sound like? Well, the first thing that we read in the Bible about what the devil does when he speaks to us, when the devil comes against you, this is the first thing he'll do. He'll oppose what God said. When we look at Genesis, right back in the beginning, in Genesis chapter 3, and he said to the woman, has God indeed said 
you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Verse 4 in there says, you will not surely die. The, the very first thing that happened, it's a bit of a tragedy because it was God had spoken to Adam and told Adam what to do. Something got lost between the man telling the woman because Eve had a completely different perception of what it was supposed to be. And the devil knew exactly where to come in at the weakness. And he comes into Eve and he opposes her and said, did God really say? Did God really say? It's kind of similar in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus goes out in the wilderness and the devil comes to him and says, if you are the Son of God, you're supposed to be the Son of God, if you really are the Son of God, did God say, is it true? Command these stones to become loaves of bread. Is it true? Throw yourself down, for it is written. He comes against and he opposes him. Of course, we know in the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus used the word to combat that. And he used the word, he says, no, but it's also written. The second thing that the enemy tries to do is he try if he can't get you head on and oppose and say to you, did God really say, the second thing is, and this is probably the, the biggest thing that I think we can fall into the trap with, is he gets alongside you. In Genesis 3 again, he said, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In the Gospel of Matthew 4.8, the devil said to Jesus, and again the devil took him to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. If he can't get your face on, he'll come alongside you. And he says, well, if it's true, if God really did say this, you know, God just, if, he, if you just did this, it'll open your eyes. And here's probably in our, in our modern languages, if you just come along and you know what, you can have this ministry, this door can open for you, you can have all these things, all you've got to do, why are you actually stuck here? You're here in this dead end place, why are you here? Come on, leave that, go along to something else and I'll open a door for you because you really have got it. You are such a good minister of the gospel, you've got such gifting in your life and they don't even appreciate you. They didn't even say hello to you last week. You know what? That's right. They didn't say hello to me. Pastor Harry didn't say hello to me last week. It's because I wasn't here. <laughs> he didn't say hello to me last week. And I've got this gifting. I am talented. Don't you know how talented? My wife tells me I'm talented. She doesn't. My wife tells me I'm talented. She says I'm godly, but doesn't say. <laughs> I can do this. They've never noticed this gifting I've got. I go to church every week and no one's noticing this amazing capacity I've got. And someone's knocking on the door and saying, oh, look at this opportunity. I have seen this time and time and time again. Time and time. Now, let me clarify that as well. There's another side to that as well. And the other side to that is if you're when you're under a leadership that doesn't recognise how to build people. And how to get people involved in the kingdom of God. Yes, there's another side. But the Bible says your gifting makes a way for you. Your gifting makes a way for you. And I can testify after 47 years of being a Christian that I have never yet asked for one thing. God is open. I've, I've made a lot of mistakes. I've done a lot of the other side going, what am I doing here? I'm better off over here. And realize what a mistake. I'm going back. Because I realised the importance of being in covenant. I realised the importance of being, submitting unto leadership. And submitting into leadership isn't about them going, well, I can't do this. I've got to check with my pastor. Can I do this? Check with my pastor. And that. It's bringing things and saying, pastor, what do you think? I feel to go here or go there. Well, no, I don't know about that one. I think this one's good. Well, let's pray and let's see what God is saying. And let the Lord determine. That there needs to be a balance. And you know what? I believe that God has got people in this building, even here right now, that he desires an amazing destiny for. There is so much potential right here in this room. So much potential for the kingdom of God. But it'll never happen 
when we feel like we need to break away from something, and I'm not talking about God not sending and releasing people, I'm talking about doing things the right way. But the devil tries to do that. He'll try and dampen the anointing. He'll try and put the fire out inside you. Of course, the other voice and the third voice that we're open to hearing is the voice in being led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's voice can be the hardest to hear because it's that wrestle within my voice and what I desire and what the Lord is saying. When we go out to the shops and we, I'm out with Seal, the usual scenario is Seal goes into the shops, I wait outside as most guys do. Wait till she's finished, praise the Lord for Facebook, and we just play on our phones until my wife has finished shopping. And if she's too long, I'll go inside and I'll look for her. Now, Seal and I, we've known each other, well, we've known each other since we were 13, but she was living in Adelaide, but she's been up here for almost 40 years. And so we've known each other for nearly 40 years. And when I go into the shops and I'm looking around for Seal, Of course, I'm looking for a short woman with black hair. But it's not just a short woman with black hair. It's also the mannerisms. I can hear Seal's voice. If she's speaking or doing, I can hear her voice. I recognise her tone. I not only recognise her voice, I recognise her language. I recognise how she speaks. I not only recognise how she speaks, I I recognise how she walks, how she behaves, how her mannerisms are, how she does things. I recognise all of that, as all good husbands should. (laughs) Yeah, as all good husbands. And I recognise it. Why? Because we've built a relationship. That's how we're supposed to be with the Father. That we build a relationship with him. That we hear what God is saying. We hear what God is doing. That we know that, yes, God is leading me to this place and the Holy Spirit will do something and say something that is beyond you. Imagine if we had to live some of the things that they did in the Bible. You go, goodness me. From the 12 people in the boat, only one said, Lord, command me to come into the water. Command me to come into the water. And you know what I want to tell you this morning is he's commanding every single person. Get out of the boat. Come to me. Come to me. Every single person. It's building that relationship. When we turn to 1 Chronicles. In 1 Chronicles chapter 14, we have the story of David. When you look at these two men, you look at it and on the surface you go, how on earth did Saul lose the kingdom? Saul didn't do, he said, kill all the Amalekites, and he obviously didn't do it all. But he did most of it. He was supposed to destroy all the goods, and he didn't. He says, oh, no, no, we'll keep some for the Lord. He didn't keep it for himself. He kept some, and he, he said, I think this is a better way. The second thing he did was he didn't wait it. Now, remember the Bible says that Saul went out, and when the Spirit of God came upon him, he prophesied. On the other side of the coin, you've got a man who committed adultery. All his wives wasn't enough. He didn't do what he was supposed to do and go out with his men into battle. He stayed on the roof, saw a woman who was bathing, said, I'll have her, took her. He then, when he finds out she's pregnant, he then tries to hide it and he does premeditated murder. To a guy that he knew. If this is what he could do to a guy that he knew, imagine what he could do to a guy he didn't know. And he has premeditated murder and he takes him. He doesn't act when his son commits an act. He doesn't act when other things, the the two just don't match up. Yet the Bible says he has found a man after his own heart. What is so different in the two? To me it comes down to one thing. That despite David's flaws and despite David's misgivings, he understood to fall at the mercy of God. And when God said, this is going to come upon you, 
He always was, Lord, it's in your hands. You do whatever's needed. Even when he was fleeing from Absalom and they were going out and this person was coming out, I think it was uh, Shimea, was coming out and cursing him and cursing him. And I said, stop it. He said, no, no, because if it's the Lord, then this is what I deserve. David in his time had understood and there was obedience in listening to the Holy Spirit. See, I, I find that really encouraging. Because it doesn't matter how many times you make a mistake. I'm sure no one here has done premeditated murder. And I think no matter how much we stuff up, no matter how many mistakes we make, there is the grace of God that is there that we can say, Lord, I fall at your mercy. Yes, there are consequences for the decisions we make. So in this chapter here, 1 Chronicles 14, in verse 8, now the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over all Israel and all the Philistines went to search for David and David heard of it and went out against them. Then the Philistines went and made a raid on the valley of Rephaim. It's the valley of giants. When you look at the language there, David went out and he was caught between the valley of giants and the valley of hell. So really there was a literal place. It wasn't a great place. And David inquired of God, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands? And the Lord said to him, Go up, for I will deliver them into your hands. So they went up to Baal Perazim, uh, master of breakthroughs. That's what Baal Perazim means. And then David defeated them there. And then David said, God has broken through my enemies by my hand like a breakthrough of water. Therefore, they called the name of that place Baal Perazim. And when they left their, and when they left, that's the Philistines, left their gods there, David gave a commandment and they were burned with fire. Then the Philistines once again made a raid on the valley. Therefore David inquired again of God and God said to him, you shall not go up after them, circle around them and come up, come up upon them in front of the mulberry trees and it shall be when you hear a sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, then you shall go out to battle for God is going out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. So David did as God commanded him and they drove back the army of the Philistines from Gibeon as far as Gezer. Then the fame of David went to all the lands. David understood how to inquire of God. He understood not just once, but how to continually say, Lord, do I do this? Lord, do I go out? Lord, do I do, go this way? And he understood what it was to listen and do exactly what the Lord had wanted him to do. No more, no less. No more, no less. In this example in David here, the David talk to God. Do we talk to God like he's real? How do you talk to the Father? Do you have conversations with God that he's there? He's literally there. Do you come back? I love conversations with God. I love conversations with God. And do we acquire again of the Lord and put things to the Lord? Bring, being led by the Holy Spirit is bringing God into what you're doing. It's not relying on me. It's relying on what he says and being able to move in that. In this example of Baal Perazim, we see that when we're led by the Spirit of God, and David was led by the Spirit of God, that God fights for you, that God moves on your behalf. I think that today... We really can use a lot of people. That we need to sharpen how we're led by the Spirit of God. There's a price to it. But the price to it, I think so often, I don't know if we're prepared to pay. Because we tend to live for the now. We tend to live of what is my, what's happening in my life right now. But how much are we preparing for eternity? One day Marie is going to see her hubby and her daughter. She's preparing for eternity, preparing for what God has. And saying, Lord, what is this task that you have for me? How am I led by you? 
How am I able to move forward in what you have? What is the call that you place? To be able to say, here I am, Lord, your humble servant. Do with me as you will. Lead me wherever you would like me to go. For, Lord, I desire to see your glory move. And I desire to see the breakthrough of your name. That in every situation that we see breakthrough, like the breakthrough of water. And we've seen so much through nature that when water, well, natural arch, I did ask Andrew if he jumped. You're not allowed to jump through there anymore. Yeah. When I was young, you could jump through there. We used to go all the time, jump through that hole in the rock. And um, <laughs> we used to go there and do that and jump through because water had just gone through, gone through when we were at... Um, up at 1770, I took a photo of this rock face, and it was way back. And I was looking at the erosion on the rock because water had continually beat through this, and you cannot stop it. It just carved away the rocks, and there was breakthrough. He's the Lord of the flood. He's the God of the breakthrough. He's the God of the breakthrough. And I really want to encourage you this morning that what is it that you need your breakthrough in? What is it that you are waiting on God for? What is it that you are waiting to see how can you be led by God into this next place? Is it just for the now? Let me say this too. God is concerned about your now because he's loving. God is concerned about your now. Right where you're at, he's concerned about your now just as much as he knows what the future is. What does God have in store for us, for Momentum Church, for you and I? What does God have in store for God using you to reach this world? That no person would be lost, that what people would know. See, I believe the Spirit is looking not for who has the greatest gifts. There are a lot of gift things out there, but remember, your gifts can get you through a door, but it's your character that keeps the door open. Without character, you can't sustain. It's being in the character of God, in the nature of God, to move right through. And what does God have? I really believe that God is looking for people who are willing to lay everything down and say, Lord, use me. Use me. Take my life. Take my life. All that I am. Could we stand this morning, please? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Who's believing for a breakthrough this morning? Is anyone believing for a breakthrough? Just hold your hands up. Keep your hand up if you're believing for a breakthrough. I want to pray. Father, right now I just pray for all those hands lifted up. And Lord, I thank you that you are the God of the flood. I thank you, Father, that all things are in your hand. And, and we come in faith this morning, knowing that all things are possible in you. I pray for every person with their hands raised. I pray for every person right now for your deliverance, O oh God, that we would see breakthrough. I speak it into our now. I call what is not as though it is, and I speak, Lord, from Romans, where you, God, see things what is not, and you bring it into the now, for you have created all things, and at your word, all things are done. So I pray for answered prayer. And for every situation, I just speak a release I pray, God, for the release of your anointing that would bring the breakthrough into all our lives in Jesus' name. And even for those watching online, breakthrough in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Perhaps this morning you've been praying for God to just be clearer in the Holy Spirit, to actually hear God clearer. Who would like to hear God clearer? Yeah, I do too. You know what I've learned? It doesn't matter how often I hear his voice. You still have that, ooh, is that God? Is that God or is that me? No, no, it can't be me. No, it's God. It's God. No, it's not going well. It's probably me. It's probably me. No, no, it's God. It's God. No, no, it's me. We all need to learn to hear his voice clearer. Father, I pray, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would lead us. Lead us in every way. 
Lead us, Lord. Lead us in your purpose and plans. Lead us in, your, in the things that you have, O oh God. For, Lord, I know, glory to you, who is able to do abundantly and exceedingly more than we can ask, think, or imagine. I thank you, O oh God, that you have all things in store, and I pray, O oh God, for that relationship with every hand that is raised wanting to hear you more, that relationship to deepen, O oh God, that we would walk and step into a greater level of faith, that we would walk and step into a greater position of that relationship with you, O oh Lord, that Holy Spirit, that we would know you, that we would know your ways, that we would know your walk, that we would know your sound, that we would know your voice and your smell and your nature, that we would know every aspect of you, Holy Spirit, that all you would have to do is look and we would respond. And I pray for that right now. And I just speak a release of that in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen.